Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 541 of the podcast. And it is Sunday, the 28th of March, 2021, as I record this. And yes, we are a quarter of the year through already. Can you believe it? I certainly can't. (laughs) Uh, In today's show, I'm talking to Tristra New Year Jaeger from the Music Tectonics podcast on the parallels with the music industry that we have in publishing. And the music industry is usually a few years ahead uh, of books. So it's definitely fascinating to see what might be coming and uh, some thoughts on technology and all of that. And we talk about the empowerment of the indie musician, multiple streams of income, and the uses of blockchain and AI in the music industry. That is coming up. Now, before we get into the interview with Tristra, I wanted to report back on South by Southwest, which I attended digitally. And I'm really thrilled because I wanted to go to South by, uh, South by as they call it, uh, for many years. But uh, And it's a conference and a music and film festival all rolled into one, very focused on the entertainment uh, industry and also the crossover with tech. I mainly went to sessions on the future of monetizing intellectual property and digital content, AI, wearables and other creative futurist topics. And I have a few things to share that uh, were interesting. So I went to a couple of brilliant panels on navigating accelerating change in the music industry. And one of the things I felt was I wish there was a conference like this for authors. I was so disappointed that none, nothing at South by Southwest was about books and publishing. I feel like we should be there uh, as an industry, but we're not and we don't have an equivalent. So that was kind of one overwhelming feeling was like, these are my people. These are my creative futurist artists. And uh, yet, there we go. There was no talk of books. But in terms of things relating directly to authors, they talked a lot about artists need to own their own databases and email lists and be able to reach them directly to have a healthy future. Uh, They talked about using the massive platforms as a way into the funnel and then offer premium products and experiences to fans. Yes, (laughs) it's the multiple streams of income talk. And I heard it in the music industry too. They said that creators do need to release more um, regularly, that you can't just release one album every couple of years now. Artists need to think more about delivering regular content. That might not be more albums or more songs, but it might be other things. They talked about having different offerings, and it's not just about making money from streaming. They called it the era of digital artist monetization with hundreds of ways to make a living, but not the old way. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this sounds tremendously familiar. So I, I, th- I think I felt happy that they were talking about the same stuff because it, it, it means that this is happening across the creative industries, not just with books. They did talk about two big shifts happening right now. Big artists selling entire backlists to music investment firms. And we've talked about that and there's been a lot in the news, you know, Bob Dylan, Stevie Nicks, etc. So these are sort of older artists with bigger backlists selling them en masse and getting a big chunk of cash. And also on the second way is sort of the opposite, which is artists taking control and selling direct, being empowered to sell everywhere, including direct to fans and hiring a team to help. And again, this is reflected in the publishing industry. Many authors have already sold their backlist to publishers. That's what most contracts are. Essentially, they take the control of your IP for the life of copyright. And some of us are taking control and managing our own IP. They did note that artists have a lot more choice than ever. So exciting times. There were many talks and panels on blockchain, digital scarcity and NFTs, because of course music, I mean, musicians are doing a lot of these NFTs or nifties, which I covered in episode 538 a couple of weeks ago and added my detailed thoughts, if you haven't listened to that yet, in addition to the interview with Simon-Pierre Marion. And they mentioned, it was so funny, they were like, oh, well, we can't name any names, but by the end of the year, you know, in the next year, basically some very big artists are coming into this space and it's going to make it mainstream stream. 
they did really stress and uh, they stressed that provenance from the creator is going to become more important. And this, again, it, it feeds into what we've been saying around, you know, double down on being human, use the technology to even prove your humanity. And I feel like this idea of provenance, you will be able to tell that this is a a real product from this real musician, because it will be marked um, with, you know, whether it's an NFT, you know, which is like a a certificate of provenance, really, it's saying, yes, this is a real digital collectible, for example. But they also mentioned that the language is going to change, which again, I discuss with Simon Pierre, which is we're not going to talk about blockchain in the same way we don't talk about HTTP protocol. You know, we don't talk about the technology behind the Internet. We just talk about the things we're doing on the Internet. And that's going to be the same. In fact, they said we're going to put people off joining these things if we use complicated words. So it will just be digital collectibles, for example, instead of NFT, which is just, you know, sounds like something from banking or (laughs) I don't know, it's a consultancy. But uh, there will be many digital products with apps that also use native currency. They talked about the fact that most people will never use crypto, um, cryptocurrencies, that they will be much happier buying digital collectibles with US dollars or GBP or euro or whatever currency. So um, that native currency and a move to not using technological words is going to be what makes this mainstream. I also wanted to be clear that I'm talking about this stuff as an awareness of what is coming. I do not have cryptocurrency. I am not intending to do an NFT until I'm clearer on the smart contracts. Because of course, once you make a smart contract, it's on blockchain and it can go on and on and on. And so uh, I'm going to be very clear on how I want to do things. And I'm waiting for the sh- it, things to play out a bit further because this, so I'm preparing you and preparing me for the shift. It is not advice on doing this right now. Um, I did one book on blockchain to test it out, but and But for example, I just learned about Flow blockchain, which is really interesting. A lot of the musicians are using Flow and that may be even more flexible than Ethereum. But this morning, as I came to record this intro, what I normally do just before I record the intro is I just check my various blog feeds to see if there's anything just happened that I can share. And this morning, Microsoft announced that they are launching an identity platform on Bitcoin's blockchain. Now, you don't need to know the technicalities of this, but Microsoft obviously is a very big company. And uh, when the big boys arrive in this area, then you know that things are possibly going to become very mainstream. And to me, this, we you know, talking about copyright on blockchain, we have to have the copyright assigned to a real person. Now, of course, many crypto purists will say the whole point is that you can't track people. But when it comes to copyright and proving that you're a real person in order to um, sort of create these digital digital collectibles and stuff like that, we have to. And in fact, having an author verified persona is exactly what we need to help stop things like piracy and to enable this type of uh, product. So I'm pretty excited that Microsoft has just announced this. Doesn't mean that I'm jumping in with that either. But what it means is that I think in the next year, we're going to see a lot of movement because now it's like, okay, (laughs) this is going to go mainstream. Now, I have been early too many times and well, I... I've been early and it's helped me. So for example, in podcasting, I started in 2009 and it has helped me for sure because I've been going so long and therefore have a bigger audience and can stand out in the niche. But equally, I have been hurt by um, being too early. For example, I did translation into German, Italian and Spanish in 2014 and it was an epic fail. I spent too much money. I didn't sell hardly any books and essentially I was probably five years early with those languages and now I'm behind. So the people who waited are now ahead of me. Um, And audiobook deals, although uh, I basically jumped in to do audiobooks about 18 months before ACX launched here in the UK and I was tied in for seven years of 
royalties with a American publisher. So <laughs> basically, when I'm early, it can go one of two ways. But what I feel with this is I'm waiting to see how it shakes out. But I want, but this is coming. It's like you can see it coming, but you need to be clear what you want to achieve. And I'm not quite clear on my own strategy yet. So I wanted to be sort of very honest up front with you guys about that. So back to South by Southwest. Uh, I went to a masterclass with Spotify. And as ever, I was even more impressed with the company. I just, you know, sometimes you realise that this is going to be a very big thing. And Spotify obviously is a very big thing already, but they have such ambition and they are working so hard to make this the best thing for listeners, but also they're doing a lot for creators. They have launched tons of things in the last couple of weeks, including uh, a website which essentially shares more information about royalty splits. They are now in 170 countries and their stated ambition is to be the world's leading audio platform. And audio platform includes audio books, so I think it's inevitable. They talked about winning the game and about changing the game and building the next generation of audio. And uh, this is another reason that I think staying wide with audiobooks is really important because we'll be able to jump into Spotify when it becomes easier. And uh, it can be done right now through various convoluted ways, but I'm waiting again, I'm waiting to see how it goes. Obviously, I would love it to be through uh, Findaway um, or Spotify Direct or whatever it's going to be, but that is still early doors, basically. Also, as context for this episode, check out the podcast series, Spotify, A Product Story. And it's really into how Spotify got started in the days of sort of, you know, when piracy was rife in the sort of Napster. And then how do you convince people to pay for something they can get for free? How do you steal from a pirate and change digital behaviour? Fascinating in terms of the psychology of the consumer in that we're happy to pay for convenience, which is really interesting. And also that people will pay to have easy access with no ads. And there are many parallels with books, of course. So that's Spotify, a product story. Again, I'll put all the links in the show notes. Another big theme of South by Southwest was the metaverse, a term coined by Neil Stevenson in his book Snow Crash. But it's basically the virtual world. And if you if you haven't watched Ready Player One, I mean, yes, obviously you can read the book, but I actually think watching the movie will give you a much better idea of metaverse. Uh, you should definitely watch it, especially if you're not a gamer. I'm not a gamer. And uh, it really helped me understand the sort of virtual world idea. There were a number of panels on the acceleration of VR adoption, so virtual reality, um, especially around the music events that have happened within Roblox and Fortnite, which are gaming platforms during the pandemic, which streamed to millions of people. So so hip hop artist Travis Scott had 12.3 million people watching his concert in Fortnite. And although these are gaming platforms, they've started to host events as well. So, for example, uh, Berkeley students, university students hosted their graduation in Minecraft. There was also a Forbes article a few days ago. It reported uh, award winning artist Viviane Schwartz, who said Zoom sucks. We've started having editorial meetings in Red Dead Redemption instead, which is a Western themed game set in the American frontier of 1899. And I think this is fascinating because I'm not even a full time, I'm not a full time worker. I'm certainly a full time worker, but my husband spends a lot of time in Microsoft Teams. He's working for a, a pharmaceutical company. And this is fascinating, this quote from Viviane, because how much cooler is it to have a work meeting in a Western themed game uh, set in the American frontier. I mean, it just gives you more interest. And a lot of these things will have VR headsets in the, in the next few years. I also think it's interesting to listen to Mark Zuckerberg, who's interviewed on the Information Podcast. Whatever you think about Mark Zuckerberg, he certainly uh, controls a lot of money and a lot of tech. <laughs> and he talks about VR as basically the next iteration of where we will all exist and the next iteration of platform of the internet of all of that and this is it, this is um you can get it on your podcast app so it's called the information and mark zuckerberg in march 2021 and he really talks about why they have heavily invested in oculus and his vision for it and if you think about i mean going back to those digital 
scarcity assets if you think that they might even be more valuable in a virtual world for example you have your virtual art on the virtual wall of your bookstore or your studio or whatever or your shop or something all the stuff on VR talked about the acceleration and that the use cases has sort of dramatically accelerated with the pandemic and how people think the world is going to work as we move forward. Yes, many of us are craving physical live events, but they really feel like the tipping point has happened with VR. Facebook also shared this week on the next web a wrist wearable concept. So at the moment, a lot of the VR stuff is sort of these handheld uh, things and haptic gloves and, you know, the headsets and all that. But this is a wrist wearable device. And go and look at the video. It's quite interesting. And it lets you do certain things. So I think that's where we're going with the ver- the wearables is moving into more natural looking devices. Yeah, many, many exciting things. Also, uh, the Exponential Wisdom podcast in the last week with Peter Diamandis and Dan Sullivan talked about creating AI avatars and how they're getting much more realistic. Although, of course, many of us don't necessarily want realistic avatars. And I think that's what's interesting also in Ready Player One is what you can do with your avatars. Again, this is all meant to be information on what other people think are coming and what has accelerated again in the pandemic. Not saying that you need to do anything right now, just, well, definitely watch Ready Player One (laughs) for sure. But have have a listen to some of these things and sort of understand what might be coming in the next five to 10 years, essentially. I did also go to a two day AI conference at the Turing Institute. Well, it was virtual. It was all on Zoom, but uh, all on online platform. Uh, So it was very interesting, but it was way over my head. (laughs) It was mostly academics presenting on their various AI stuff. And I basically came away with an impression that some very clever people are working on some very big problems, mainly trying to solve things like the environment and healthcare and all of this, as well as tackling bias, aiming for ethical AI, and essentially trying to make sure the future works for all of us. So the main thing I came away with was was no one cares about books, AIs writing books, like literally No one is even considering or caring about this at the level that the most of the AI work is because it's not a problem. I mean, you know, why would you have an AI write a novel when most authors do it for free? (laughs) Anyway, so I came away going, wow, I think actually you know, we're fine. And in fact, I heard Kai-Fu Lee at South by Southwest, whose book AI Superpowers, I highly recommend. He said that artists will use AI tools to experiment and elevate their work and human creativity will only become more valuable. So I came away pretty positive, actually, about, yes, there are lots of things in the world that are difficult, but a lot of humans are trying to make things better by working with uh, AI. And finally, I also went to Wired 2025, which was a look forward at the trends accelerated by the pandemic. And in addition to everything else, they said there is a trend towards people purchasing in a way that aligns with their values. And again, this comes into the idea we need to educate our readers so they can support authors by buying direct and making sure that we essentially make it very clear how readers and people in our community can support us. And I'm very encouraged. Thank you to all of you who've bought in the last week, um, bought How to Make a Living, the third edition from my website, um, payhip.com forward slash the creative pen. Lots of you bought a direct and I bought the ebook and audiobook direct. I'm thrilled about that. Thank you so much. And yeah, that money went straight into my bank account. I didn't have to wait 60 days. Yay. (laughs) so that's a whole load of updates and things I've obviously been learning a lot filled notebooks with notes and that is the sort of high level stuff but it's certainly been very interesting for me to look into the future and I wasn't surprised by anything I heard because I've been talking about this stuff for a while but the the sense that it has really accelerated with the pandemic is almost more and more clear all the time 
In my personal update, the German edition of Your Author Business Plan is finished and goes live next week. And I have officially cleared the decks of all my open projects. So yay for the finishing energy. It's certainly the last month I feel like I've been doing all those bits and bobs that you do, you know, formatting and all the launchy stuff and blah, blah, blah. But it is done. And I'm really quite thrilled because I needed to get a whole load of stuff finished, close all the boxes as you do. And then I feel like I need a bit of fallow time. So, you know, like a field after harvest, you you don't plant immediately. Also, I need to fill my creative well, which is generally filled by experiences and doing things, you know. So I'm not jumping in straight to other things. I am doing research right now. I'm reading a lot of books on the shadow side and I've got my books for the Thomas Beckett's Day of the Martyr, but I'm giving myself a little bit of slack. (laughs) So you might need a bit of slack too after the year we've all had. So yeah, I'm not writing at the moment. Well, I'm, I, I've been writing a lot of notes, obviously. I've been going to a lot of um, online conferences and stuff and writing thoughts, but generally just trying to have a little fallow time before I can fill my creative well again. So my book Delirium this week is in the limited time Secrets and Lies story bundle. If you like mystery and crime, you will definitely want to check out this story bundle, storybundle.com forward slash mystery. It is a very limited time uh, deal. So get it before the 14th of April. You get 10 ebooks in the mystery and crime genre, including Christine Catherine Rush, Rebecca Cantrell, uh, Dean Wesley Smith, Mark Leslie, as in his horror guys, and Rachel Amflett, and a whole load more authors. If you haven't bought a story bundle before, it's essentially a pay what you like deal. There are different levels that you can pay at. You can choose the percentage split that goes to authors. You can also choose to help support our charity, which is World Central Kitchen, helping to feed people in difficulty. You will be able to load the ebooks onto whatever device you use and read them there. So it is a very very good deal for 10 ebooks, basically nine novels and a short story collection. As I mentioned, my crime thriller Delirium is in it and that is set in the modern day but based on the history of psychiatry in London with an opening scene at the Imperial War Museum which used to be Bedlam Hospital and I'm pretty sure you've heard of Bedlam. So yes, that is uh, available now, storybundle.com forward slash mystery. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Thresher Sketch said, I really enjoyed this episode on cosies and the lovely guest. Hearing about the cosy mystery series made me want to read the books for myself. So I went and grabbed several of them for my e-reader. Yes, podcasts sell books, but only if you're a great guest as Debbie was last week. And um, I have actually done on the blog a few weeks ago, I did an episode on how to be a good guest on a podcast. So definitely check that out. And of course, it's all in all audio for authors as well, including how to pitch. I've been getting some terrible pitches recently. (laughs) So I might actually put that article on the blog as well so I can get some better pitches. (laughs) Uh, Vin said... You brought up cosy fantasy. It is a genre. Fantasy and mystery have a long history of mixing really well. There are some fun cosy fantasies out there, like Chris Kimry's series about a priest and her snarky griffin sidekick who solve mysteries in a small English-style village. Fantastic. Uh, Beth Ball said listening to the podcast on a walk at Guildford Courthouse National Military Park in NC, which I think is North Carolina. Uh, It's right next to a beautiful cemetery showing signs of spring. Lovely pictures. Thank you. And then a couple of comments from YouTube about the interview with Tara on Kobo said, uh, Vesta said on YouTube that this was really great. I'm a Canadian releasing my first children's book. I hadn't thought of building a direct relationship with Kobo. Uh, yet I know that most of my readers, if they read ebooks, will use Kobo as there are issues with Kindle and libraries in Canada. I'm going to put a lot more care into the Kobo aspect of my release. Thank you, Vesta. And finally, Burnt Scribe, who said, this podcast really did open my eyes to the possibilities of Kobo. Brilliant. 
So today's show is sponsored by Findaway Voices, which I use to distribute my audiobooks wide. I also use them to help me find a narrator. So my Matt Walker series, I didn't, I literally just didn't know what voice I wanted. I kind of had something in my head, but I didn't know. So I put the, the book up on Findaway and I basically asked them for help. And they have a way to provide you with a whole load of auditions for your book and voices. And you can choose which ones you like like and which ones to start uh, a relationship with in terms of narrator. And I found my wonderful narrator for the Matt Walker series, Charlie Sanderson, through Findaway, which I'm so happy with. And then also what I do is I load my own self-narrated books. So for example, How to Make a Living with Your Writing is now um, the third edition, I narrated. That is through Findaway. It's going out onto all the various platforms, including Authors Direct, which you can buy directly from me. And if you go to the creativepen.com forward slash audio you'll find my link to authors direct and uh, that is an app that many people really enjoy using so yeah you can also work with existing narrators you can upload your files and uh, sell that way but essentially why is this so exciting Okay, well, (laughs) I've talked about this many times, but through Findaway, you can get into 43 different distribution uh, systems, big stores. You can get into Audible and Apple Books, obviously, but you can also get into Google Play, Storytel, Kobo and Nook, Audio, Scribd, Overdrive, Hoopla, 43 retailers and library distribution systems. You can also get into Chirp, and Chirp is BookBub's audio service, which enables you to do um, audio sales and, and deals basically and they they do chirp deals but you can also do pay-per-click ads and that's what I've been using and I had my best wide audio a month a couple of months ago when I had a chirp deal it is so good to have control of your price you will know if you only publish exclusively with um, one of the others <laughs> that you can't control your price. They set it. But on Findaway, you can control your price. You can control your discounts. You can do sales periods, just like we're used to doing with eBooks. You can set different uh, time scales to do promotions. And uh, you can also set a different library price. You can do all kinds of things. And the most important thing is you are wide with audio and you essentially retain your choice. You retain your freedom. So you guys know I only work with podcast sponsors who I actively use and ethically can promote myself. And I love Findaway. I'm a real fan. I use the service all the time. I'm in there not just to upload my audiobooks, but I'm also doing promos and that type of thing. So yeah, take back your audio freedom and check out findawayvoices.com today. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons. Yes, you patrons have paid for me to attend all these different things and bring you the news and the special limited series of AI related interviews that I've been doing recently. My brain is supported by my patrons. Thanks to new patrons in the last few weeks and returning patrons too, Christy Johnston, Kit Ward. And thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, especially those of you who've been doing it for years now. You are superstars. You can support the show for just a couple of dollars or euros or GBP or Canadian dollars a month. (laughs) Less than a coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous and you get the extra monthly Q&A audio, which I uh, did. I've done for this month, obviously, and uh, I'll be doing another one in April. And you can ask your questions and I answer them. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen and you'll get the entire Q&A backlist. Right, let's get into the interview. Tristra New Year Jaeger is a writer and strategist for music PR firm Rock Paper Scissors. She's the co-host of the Music Tectonics podcast, which explores the intersection of music and technology. And she's also a fantasy novelist. So welcome, Tristra. Oh, it's great to be here. It's a real honor. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you. But before we get into it, tell us a little bit more about you and your fascinating background in writing and the music industry. Well, like a lot of people in the creative industries, I have kind of a checkered past. I, I On the music side, I always loved music so much that I was obsessed with it from a very young age, um, played music, listened to it uh, pretty much nonstop. And eventually became a record store clerk, which for people of my generation in the 90s was like the 
thing to do as a job after school. And then eventually went to college, became a professional singer for a while, um, was in a Bosnian rock and folk band, which was one of the most interesting experiences of my life. And then through my interest in Eastern Europe, I got so um, interested in their cultural traditions that I wound up pursuing a PhD in uh, what's called Central Eurasian Studies, the non- ethnically Russian parts of Russia or, you know, Central Asia, um, Tibet. And some of the research I did stuck with me and wound up springing out as a novel that is a historical fantasy set in early 19th century Petersburg and Siberia. But yeah, so I ended up writing a novel called The Tomb in the Stone based on the lives of a family that was exiled to Siberia after uh, rising up against the Tsar. So anyway, the worlds of music and writing have always been really entwined for me. So I love that you span both of these worlds. And that's really why I wanted to talk to you, because I feel like you understand a lot of, you know, obviously you understand what authors are going through. Now, the music industry is obviously a few years ahead of publishing in terms of digital disruption. So what have you seen? What are some of the major digital shifts in the last few years? And what has accelerated due to the pandemic? This is that's a really interesting and large question. The music industry got seriously transformed with the advent of the MP3 and then with file sharing. So as peer-to-peer file sharing, aka Napster, came on uh, board, it was very difficult for uh, the legacy uh, music industry, which had gotten very used to living on the fat of the land with the CD boom. So CDs have a very high profit margin. And also they allowed labels that have uh, extensive back catalogs to reissue something and get people to buy it a second time, which is, you know, as a a, a capitalist working in intellectual property, that's like a dream come true, right? So, Mm. So we went from this sort of huge bonanza of prosperity to this incredible collapse. And so what's resulted from that has been seriously interesting. Okay, let's talk about the downside first. There is a huge flood of content. So as this change in consumption opportunities via digital file sharing, the availability of music that could be sent back and forth between people in a small compressed file, that also was accompanied with an amazing transformation of the of of recording technology so people could start making really viable artistically excellent music in their in their home and not for you know not having to spend $50,000 to make that happen so there's really a flood of content we're facing now and that's just accelerating like i think recently in the financial times there was some statistics thrown around by the the ex um, economist of spotify will page and he mentioned that there's you know i think it's like one of, I can't remember, there's just a huge amount every second of of songs, of tracks being uploaded. And many of them are by independent artists. So artists that aren't officially signed to a, a music label. So what happens though, when you have this much content available is there is a bit of a race to the bottom. So it's been a really massive struggle on the part of music professionals, professional artists, publishers, who are the people who manage the composition side of the music business. So there are two copyrights for each musical work. One is for the song itself, like what you could write down on a piece of paper and notate. And the other one is for the actual recording itself. So all of those sides have struggled immensely to reconnect what is a you know, sustained love of music and perhaps that's grown even um, and demand for good music with the monetary value of that music and the cost of production. So there's been a huge challenge to try to re-monetize, to mm. put it in kind of a corporate terms, um, music itself. And I think that's something that a lot of book authors, especially those who had made their careers prior to the advent of things like the Kindle, that's they can probably relate to that pretty intimately. There's also a real an upside. There's always an upside. Um, and that the fact is that a lot of artists can make their own careers in very distinct and um, interesting ways. Um, indie pathways are really wide open now. So an independent artist can release, promote, and uh, tour, do everything they want with their music. And that pathway is no longer stigmatized. It's no longer seen as like a second hand, you know, a second grade choice. 
So there's a lot of new opportunities as well that have come about thanks to the digitization of other um, kinds of media. So synchronization, meaning putting music to picture, whether it's a video or a film or a show on Netflix, there is a whole big, big uh, crop of apps coming out everything from meditation apps to fitness routines. There is live streaming. There is a new opportunity to interact with fans and to make some additional money from your recordings by allowing remixes or encouraging remixes, issuing stems. And stems are just like the individual music tracks. So like the drum track, the the guitar track, the vocal track, the keyboard track. So you can send, you can have these packages of bits and pieces, which is something you can't really do with a uh, a work of uh, like a long work of nonfiction or a novel, but you can have these little bits and pieces that your fans can play around with and make their own versions of or cre- use to create their own expressions. So that's one of the upsides is there. there's just new ways to use and think about music that we never had even, you know, 15 years ago. Mm, and it's so similar like I feel we were just a few years behind obviously you mentioned the mp3 and file sharing and that's the mp3 is also like ebooks mm-hmm. and I think file sharing I would say we'll come to subscription in a minute but I feel like subscription is almost file sharing because it's as like you said a race to the bottom where yeah. people can have unlimited content and reading so it just makes and and, and, e- and ebooks also you know a lot of us use free and then hopefully sell for other you know other books for more money but it's still only a few dollars Mm -hmm. so yeah there's so many things but I'm glad you said also the the upside because of course this is an an indie author podcast authors (laughs) taking control of their careers and and I think you know being an indie musician has been very cool for a while and being an indie filmmaker has been cool but I feel like indie authors (laughs) might might still be behind the curve I don't think people think we're cool yet but (laughs) do, do you think in the music industry they're there has been a similar stigma or is it that there is a very sort of respected independent musician thing or when you talked about a flood of content is there are there some negative feelings towards independence or how how is that go is there a stigma anymore that's a really excellent question I would say in general no uh an artist who takes control of their career and say hires a team if they get to that level or manages all of the aspects of their business well is highly respected in the music business. And we're definitely getting to a point where having a label is not an essential part of success or of reaching a large audience. That said, that wasn't always the case. And if you think about, there have always been some really active, exciting, independent, like small late, small music labels that were putting out um, LPs or in the dance community, say putting out um, 12 inches. There's all sorts of great vintage vinyl you can find that's, that shows the activity on that. But it was never, you know, you couldn't get a very wide distribution network. It was really tough to get access to fans. It was very difficult to get on radio. Um, so... All of that meant that sometimes people didn't take it seriously. And now we've got someone like Chance the Rapper. You've got a lot of artists. You have folks like Taylor Swift, who's, you know, well, she's not independent. She's signed to a major. She's made some moves, like trying to um, get control of her catalog and her repertoire in a way that is sort of an indie kind of indie-esque, right? Mm. So there's just been a lot of a lot of change. And I, I really think we're going to get to the point with, with books and authorship as well, where that's no longer seen as like an act of vanity or foolishness, or you're just not good enough to cut it, or you haven't. And I think there's just, it's going to transform in a similar way. Mm, cool. Now, I want to come on to streaming and subscription, because I feel like this is something that has, I mean, even dramatically uh, changed in the pandemic as well. The growth in, as you said, Spotify, but there's lots and lots of subscription apps now. And this kind of... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think the publishing industry thinks it's an apocalypse. And as you said, <laughs> I've I read that FT article and I've read conflicting opinions. On the mm. one side, you've got massive big names selling their entire back catalogue in order for those investment companies to make mm-hmm. money basically through streaming. And bands like Bon Jovi, you and I are a similar age, like, <laughs> you know, Bon Jovi living on a prayer, apparently is making more money now than it has for like 30 years because 
people like us are listening to it again. So they're seeing money from things, their backlist essentially. But also we hear horror stories of creatives making a couple of hundred dollars a year on streaming. So Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on streaming and, and how can we use it to in combination with everything else, I guess, without relying on it entirely? So first, I'm going to I want to talk a bit about how music, how payouts for music streaming work. And it's a complex system because it's called pro it's pro rata. So that means you only there's a limited pie that then gets divided up according to how often an artist was streamed. So it gets really complicated and it depends on, you know, who the subscriber is. Are they listening in India or Indianapolis are they uh, so far, are they on the freemium tier or are they a premium list? It just it's super complicated. But that aside, there's an important element that keeps getting forgotten, and that is there are a lot of middlemen in the music business, probably even more than in in publishing and books. There's just a lot of layers of contractual contractual. Um, how should I put this? There's there are many fees and many little snips and cuts that get taken out. So if you hear about an artist like say Gary Newman making you know um, pennies from a lot of streams, it's often because he had a crappy contract. To put it, excuse the expression, but you know record labels have made contracts um, related to digital media with important artists that basically give the record labels lots of leverage to pay things out on a fairly, um, you know, to in bits and pieces and dribble it out. So it's, it's a, it's an issue that needs to be addressed head on. And the industry still has to grapple with that. And if the book world can avoid that, they should. Um, so getting the middlemen out of the way in some ways, when the pie has become slightly smaller in terms of uh, revenues is, is essential, but that's a whole other debate. But let's talk a bit about how, how it works for artists. So if I'm an artist who owns who owns my the copyright to both sides of my work, so I'm the songwriter and the recording artist, I can sometimes do pretty well on streaming. However, I'm not going to get all of my income from one platform. So, and the tendency right now is towards fragmentation. So in the pandemic, especially YouTube has done really well in terms of growth for artists. It pays out on average a lot less per stream than um, Deezer, Spotify, etc. But the, the fact is that I'm going to be getting my money from 10 different sources instead of one, if we're looking back at the iTunes era, um, or, you know, four or five, if we're looking at like five or six years ago. So it's a really complicated landscape as a, as a creative. So you, and you also need to be everywhere. So you need to make sure you have distribution in place where you're going to reach everybody. Um, and music is more, is, can, can cross boundaries and, and borders a lot more easily. Like you can really dig a dance track from around the world, from India, even if you don't speak, you know, uh, Gujarati, right? You could really get into this song, even if you have no idea what someone is singing about. So, and that's a little tougher with books since they are based in a language that you must have, you have to know mm. to enjoy. But the, the principle is the same. Um, platforms are, fra- I mean, are, are, um, our fans, our reader base is going to be fractured all over the world. So in 2020, because of the collapse of live touring, which was a huge portion of income, especially for the middle tier of independent or uh, or more like you know mid-career artists, so not the top 1% that everybody knows and not the sort of huge... Uh, uh, 80% of folks who just like put out music for fun or just like do all sorts of crazy weird stuff. And, you know, like there's a lot of artists that put out things for their own reasons and they're not really out on the road, like hitting 20 cities and trying to make a, a really full on living um, playing music. All right. But when touring collapsed, artists had to look for other opportunities. I mean, it was a really rough period, the first couple of months of the pandemic, especially because there was also a, a concurrent kind of, lack of interest in streaming music. So it was really, really hard for a lot of artists. And But artists are creative and they dug into everything from, you know, figuring out a way to charge for live stream performances, looking for more and more um, sync opportunities. And some artists really specialize in creating music that's perfect for advertisements, um, videos, that kind of thing. 
they've a lot of uh, there's a lot of ability beyond just pa Patreon. There's a lot of sort of specialty subscription platforms designed just for musicians um, that allow folks to create custom content or release things in a way that engages fans and yet allows them to keep kind of more of that revenue for themselves without having to go through a platform or a middleman. And then there's all sorts of merch that artists can sell that I, mean, I, I have, a, you know, I'm sure there are authors out there that have aced this, but musicians are super creative in coming up with cool things to sell people. And we can talk about that in a minute, but there, there's been a lot of just creativity, like, you can basically have like a virtual studio tour with me or people are teaching music lessons or selling beats, you know, so the, the instrumental bed that goes beneath like uh, a hip hop track or an, uh, an electronic music track. People just do whatever they can to kind of put the pieces together. And it's and they've been finding ways to collaborate remotely on recording sessions. So artists are finding all sorts of interesting ways to make money, but that's not surprising, right? I mean, creative <laughs> people are pretty scrappy. <laughs> so, so in short, people have been mixing it up and, and trying to, you know, just, there's a big openness now to things that aren't the traditional, like I sell this thing or I play this show. Um, so, and it's, it's going to be different for every creative based on their sort of aesthetic community and their, their approach to their own work. I, I love that. And uh, I'm pretty obsessed with multiple streams of income. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's great to hear that. Uh, obviously, people have uh, have pivoted. That I think there was almost a, a sort of fr freezing moment in this time last year as we record this. So sort of March 2020, we didn't really know what was going on. And there was a, a moment where we thought maybe it wouldn't last very long. And, and then it was like, oh, right, we do have to adjust. And I, yes. I feel like it was like there was almost a couple of weeks where no one could do anything. And then all of this stuff started coming out and, and we realized all the opportunities that we did have. So again, it's it's like you said, there's there's that downside, obviously, a lot of downsides in the pandemic. But the upside is that a lot of creatives have discovered new ways to make money that are not reliant on like touring. And, and presumably that's a positive for a lot of people because again, positive and negatives with touring, but it, it means that people have been able to figure out different ways to make money which is which is fascinating yes touring is a very difficult business model and it can be extremely disruptive to people's personal lives especially as they age into things like wanting to have a family or wanting to say own a home or maintain a slightly more stable lifestyle I mean some people like Willie Nelson for instance it's just he's a road warrior he loves it um, but that's, I, I wouldn't say that's everybody. And it's great for some folks who have, or maybe who have a disability or who have an obligation to, as a caretaker to somebody else, to be able to uh, find other ways to be a musician and create their art and find their fans and interact with them. But they're not required to get in a van, load up all of their equipment. Like it's grueling, you know. So um, it's it's much better for a lot of people to find other things. And now now the fans have come along, mm. and there's more interest in the the other upside. And I think we'll see how this plays out in the next couple of years. But fans care now. They know this artist has been making stuff that's made my life better, and I I need to give back if I can in in whatever small way I can. And there's a, an overall sense as a society. I mean, the U.S. always struggles with this because entertainment and the market economy versus the cultural significance of creative work. But there's a sense that music is an economic, you know, driver. Um, and that when everyone in the music business basically loses their job, even if it's temporary, we've got a problem <laughs> and our communities are less vital. Our economies are less less lively, we're going to face major repercussions if people aren't making music and performing it. So mm. I, I don't know how um, that's played out exactly, you know, in, in the realm of authorship and books and, and publishing, but there's been a real recalibration of our relationship to music as uh, a cultural uh, good that benefits everybody in a variety of ways. 
Yeah, I think you said their fans care now. And this is something I, I also keep banging on about, you know, to authors <laughs> is this is what we have to double down on. You know, yes, we can have, as you said, the fragmentation of the market where we sell our books all over the world or, or our music all over the world on all these different platforms and people can find it wherever they can. But it's like a funnel. Some of those people will end up really loving our work and want to support us in other ways. They'll want, for example, I sell my ebooks and audiobooks directly direct on my website and I can make 90% you mm-hmm. know sales even including the the fees and that is impossible on any other platform other than direct from me. And some people choose to do that to support me. And so that's, I think, what we have to focus on as creatives is, look, a a small percentage, as Kevin Kelly said, a thousand true fans, you can make a living as a creative if you yes, stick your stuff everywhere, but keep also special things for your fans. So I did want to come back on merch because I feel like <laughs> merch, musicians are so good at merch and physical products. and But even things like vinyl, as uh, obviously people now also buy vinyl records mm-hmm. and that there are these physical object sales and things that people are doing for their super fans. So what, what are some of the interesting stuff you're seeing there? Well, the, one of the cool things that happened in 2020 was vinyl outpaced CDs in terms of sales. So there's a real vinyl revival going on. It started years ago, but it's, it's you know, basically picking up speed now. The problem with vinyl is it's very difficult to manufacture. And after uh, the, C- the tra- transition to CDs, a lot of vinyl factories were basically dismantled. So getting the, the production capacity has been a huge problem for the, um, the music business. Um, just like, you know, when you have a, a paper shortage, which happens periodically, it can really impact the cost of printing your own books, that kind of thing. So, but anyway, back to merch. So musicians like really like to get kind of crazy and creative. Like they'll make everything from, I don't know if, um, if this is familiar to folks outside the US, but a, a beer koozie, you know, one of those oh, weird yes. sleeves you can stick on a, on a can to um, I've seen mouse pads. I've seen, of course, things like stickers, T-shirts. I mean, it would be fun to see what authors could do with some of this stuff. I would love to see more author, crazy author merch. I've seen people will custom make things. So, you know, super handcrafted, whether it's making an alternative cover that you've painted yourself and send to a fan and you make like a limited edition of 100, um, screen prints of various kinds. I mean, musicians really love to get super crazy. And then we also, the interesting thing I've also seen that when I was thinking about our talk today, I haven't seen as much with authors, but um, there is a massive interest in musicians as potential sort of brand, either brand leaders, like someone like, you know, with Fenty or um, entrepreneurs with Dr. Dre and Beats, the headphones that eventually um, was sold, they were sold to Apple. So, you know, there's a huge entrepreneurial spirit, like musicians are trying to make stuff that's not just music. And it really depends on the, on, on the, the band or the uh, musician we're talking about. And beyond that, I wanted to add kind of to the mix and, and I'm not sure where this is going for other creative realms, but musicians lately have been really obsessed with non-fungible tokens. So Mm, NFTs um, are are the sort of wacky offshoot of cryptocurrency, which might be more more readily recognizable to, to everyone, but it's a way you can basically issue a digital collectible that is um, unique to that. So it's a unique instance of a, it's like a digital object of which there's only one, or there's a a limited edition of. And in the art world right now, it's blowing up. And in the music world as well, like I think Grimes made $6 million for basically, you know, a a file (laughs) or two. I mean, it's more complicated than that. And it's on the blockchain and all that fun stuff. But in, in essence, it's it's a file, but it's got the rarity aspect. And that's really exciting for fans. So that's been um, a super trendy topic right now. Everything from legacy artists like Kings of Leon to, again, people like Grimes, who are kind of trying to play that edgy, high-tech kind of uh, game a bit with fandom. So it's a really, really wild range of things. Um, yeah, like I said, from people hand making and upcycling t-shirts and putting their band logo on it to folks, you know, with million dollar businesses like Fenty. So 
Mm, I'm I'm glad you mentioned NFTs. I I will by the time this goes out, there will be an episode up on blockchain and mm. digital scarcity, which I think is the answer to the race to the bottom. It means yes, sure, mm. you can have all of this music or books available for under a couple of bucks, but you can also get first editions. What we have in the past had to do with vinyl or with limited edition hardbacks. We can now do with digital limited editions. And I think a lot of people don't understand this, but I, I'm super excited about it. And I'm, I'm thinking of all these different things that I can do as an author to make these, uh, to make digital scarcity. It's such a radical concept that yeah. I'm, I'm so excited about it. And I'm, so I'm really glad you mentioned it, but I do want to get into some more, like more technical things because. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, just, to, just for one little second, sorry to, sorry to dive in again, Joanna, but I, I, I'm so excited by what you just said. I want to say there's a, creative opportunity here too and the technology could allow us to create the equivalent of those gorgeous 18th century kid leather bound gold you know gilded with like embroidery and hand painted you know we could go crazy with the digital stuff and really create something gorgeous for people that is a limited edition and very scarce. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm done, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad you're excited too. I, I feel like not enough people are excited about this yet outside the super techie space. I feel like you and I straddle the <laughs> tech space and the more, um, the, the less tech space, let's say. <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. But, yeah, but in, um, I wanted to talk about AI because I've been reading articles about AI in music for a number of years now. And there, there was a particular article in Wired a way back, which a couple of years ago now basically saying look this is happening this is already happening and it's starting to move into the mainstream the first AI co-created album happened a couple of years ago now and also a lot of the tools like Spotify which is a discover uses AI for discovery so we've got AI with creation and we've got AI in discovery so what do you think are the opportunities for AI in the music industry and what what are the thoughts in in that area oh it's 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 really interesting um Interesting issue in that there are there there's the discovery side, right? So like the playlist that your streaming platform might suggest to you that finds other tracks based on what listeners who have some of your same habits also like. So it's sort of a similarity, um, a comparative thing among among users. So you've listened to track X but you haven't heard track Y yet, but this other user has listened to track X and track Y. So your platform will suggest Y to you. And sometimes it can get really good. Now, if you're a a kind of a a spaz like me and listen to all different kinds of music, you'll get all sorts of recommendations that are, it's like throws up its hands. It's like, uh, Ricky Skaggs, uh, I don't know, uh, psychedelic furs, flock of seagulls, just whatever. But so there's some, there's still a lot of refinement that could go into it and new method, new methodology for helping people find things they like in this huge flood of music out there. One other thing that's kind of way, you know, way in the back room that most music fans might not know about is AI is incredibly important in getting artists paid. So there's been a century long problem with figuring out who is owed what and how to pay them efficiently in what's effectively long been a global industry with two complicated copyrights that vary according to territory. So it's just a nightmare in short. And so on the data management and royalty payment side, AI has been um, very important in really speeding up the process of getting the money from place to place and finding out who's actually owed. And then the more, the most sort of fun side, the most sci-fi side is the creation side. And this can be, when we think about music creation, we often think of what's effectively composing, right? Coming up with melodies or rhythms or chords or something that will timbres that will um, create a a set of sounds that that have a musical, uh, that have an emotional impact on the listener. So, but there's lots of other interesting applications for AI, and I'm sure there's some similar, um, lots of similar things that you could think about for for language and words, things like mastering. So when you have a, a, a track in a studio, you do a final mix, and then you send it to another engineer who makes it sound even better and will put like, say, make an, an album sound um, somewhat uniform in terms of like 
levels and other things. So you don't have one track that sticks out. That's like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? So there's mastering and that can be done via AI for, you know, the overwhelming majority of cases. There's things like um, EQ. So trying to get just the right mix and AI can guide you in that as well. And then of course, like I said, there's the most exciting thing, which is um, songwriting. And I've seen there's some products that do things like help a songwriter by giving them a little prompt, right? So uh, a snatch of a melody that's based on music from a certain era, or that's in a certain key, or that has a certain rhythm. There's also uh, some interesting applications for more programmatic music so music that kind of is in the background. So if you think about like the airy sort of atmospheric stuff that you hear for meditation or concentration, I mean, machines could do a pretty decent job generating that for hours. <laughs> so yeah. the other thing that's really exciting for people like me who are um, high energy and need uh, love to use music to move to um, is adaptive music. So there are programs now that can take a certain kind of composition and use AI to alter the rhythm without altering it, without distorting the sort of musical uh, integrity. And that can match your stride or your heart rate. Um, And I dream of a future where you can be, say, running on the treadmill or on the elliptical or on your bike or wherever, and you can maybe gesture or tweak something just enough so maybe you need more bass to really get your heart rate going or get really into what you're doing or lose yourself in your activity. I mean, you'll be able to just gesture or mess around with something and transform that musical piece to really suit exactly what you need um, either in your physical activity or in your, in your environment. So adaptive music is a really interesting place where AI could transform how we interact with music. Mm, I think that's definitely close. Like I, I use the Apple Plus Fitness with my Apple Watch, so it's got my heart rate on the screen. And at the moment, I obviously I choose the thing according to what I want to do workout wise. Mm-hmm. But the fact that they they have my heart rate, they can match that with the you know the, what I'm doing at the same time. I, that has, has just got to come. I, I think all of that data is is being used to train things. And as you said, I mean, we want to share our data when it gives us things we want. <laughs> so yeah. that's I totally agree, and I, I'm very interested in that. But we're, we're almost out of time. I do want to ask about the AI and copyright because <laughs> you talked about copyright earlier, and there was a particular article in The Verge that talked about okay, if you train a model with songs by Beyonce and it out. Put mm-hmm. songs that sound similar as in have the same vibe but they are not plagiarized there is not a single word that is was said by Beyonce well you know a single phrase mm-hmm. that was said by Beyonce and the music itself is not plagiarized it's original but it does have the the vibe so how does that work technically right now Beyonce does not get any money from that um, because we don't have any copyright law around using data to train machine learning music algorithms so what what are your thoughts on AI and copyright for musicians and and using data to train machines, basically. This is the point in any conversation about AI when um, music professionals break into tears and collapse (laughs) (laughs) into into a weeping pile. Um, Licensing and copyright are really the the big bugaboos, the, the real challenges in the music business when it comes to technological progress. So AI is no exception to that. We're basically going to have to build a framework that attributes uh, sort of vibes more more programmatically, more effectively, um, and that that does take into account things like authorship when you have, you know, who, who, who's the composer? Is it the person who trained the model, which is, you know, who's been given copyright for a composition in some cases of AI music? Or is it the Beyonce or, you know, Arvo Pert, or is it whoever you, who it is you, who, whose data you use to train it? And what do you do if you used like thousands of different composers works, like all of the cl- Western classical canon to train your model? Who, who owns it? You know, it, it starts to get very complicated. And, and that is definitely an evolving space that I'm sure lawyers will have a lot of fun with for years to come. One interesting precedent that's out there, just the term vibe has become like a legally, it's like there's a legal complexity around the feeling of a song. So Blurred Lines, I think it was part of this major lawsuit from the the Marvin Gaye estate 
um, I think I'm getting this right, it, it, from someone's estate basically, who said this song feels too much like this other song. And there was no shared content. There was no shared lyrical content, no lines, like musical lines, no chord changes you could really point to, um, but it felt like it. And it passed the legal test, it, you know, they, the, the estate won. So we're gonna see a lot more of that kind of litigation. And unfortunately it's just gonna have to be Often, I think it's going to be hashed out in the courts. Now, ideally, we'd all get together and sit down and create an ethical and a legal copyright framework that would help sort out some of these problems or at least begin to, or at least maybe even just lay out the principles of what we're talking about. Um, because obviously, authorship, composer, uh, ownership is transforming, like right now as we speak. And if we don't begin to think seriously about that from an ethical and a business standpoint, we're going to end up in some nasty messes and some exploitative situations. So my hope is that maybe maybe we'll do that. Maybe there'll be like a grand conference of, of musical copyright minds. It's possible, but I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. So it's kind of a half answer because it's like such a horrible elephant in the room for everyone. <laughs> well, I think, but I think it's important because the more we talk about it, the more we can start to understand it. And also I yes. keep talking about it in the hope you know and I'm trying to get involved with with the government rules around it around the world intellectual property organization I think creatives kind of go oh well someone else will sort sort that out whereas mm -hmm. I feel like we all need to get involved even though we're not copyright lawyers or we're not yeah. um, AI programmers you know we have to engage in it otherwise the people who are copyright lawyers and the people who are programmers will be the ones determining our future and exactly. we, it's just too important for that but you talk about a lot of these things and the music tectonics podcast goes into a lot of uh, of that side of things I guess and explores music mm -hmm. and technology so where else can people find you and everything you do online well, everyone can feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. That is the social network I use the most. It's like I'm the biggest goofball nerd ever. I'm also on Instagram, that kind of thing too. But it's where all you can see is like pictures of trees there. I also have a website for my creative side, which is tnewyear.com. So T New Year, just like the holiday, all one word, dot com. But if you're interested in the music business and you want to hear more about some of the crazy ins and outs, musictectonics.com is a good place to start. I'd love to talk to anyone who's interested in talking about music and books. I'm here for you. It's my two, my two obsessions. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Well, thanks so much for your time, Tristra. That was great. Absolutely. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Tristra today and that you found some interesting parallels between authors and publishing and the music industry. Definitely check out the Music Tectonics podcast for more crossovers. I was actually on that show a few months back talking about audiobooks and thoughts on voice technology. So I have another in between episode coming this week. I'm talking to Chris Banks from Pro Writing Aid about why he built the platform and his thoughts on how AI tools and machine learning can help us become better writers. Plus, it turns out we were at Oxford at the same time in the mid 1990s. <laughs> so it's a small world. In next week's show, next Monday's show, I'm talking to Jeff Elkins about dialogue and written character voice. So you're getting a blend of technology and craft, which is basically my world these days. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.